We're going to continue talking about the Bell state and an interesting application of these Bell states. Um, so, so far, like I said, we focused for the last almost three weeks fully on establishing the basics of quantum mechanics, quantum states, operators, measurement, theory, etc. Now we're discussing, even as we're discussing multi-qubit systems or multi-party systems, we simultaneously start looking at certain quantum information processing tasks, right? And this will be the first one that we'll discuss today, namely teleportation, okay? So recall that how we arrived at the Bell state. So this is what one calls the Bell state preparation circuit. Okay, I hope everyone can see the screen and my, I hope my voice is clear, right? Okay, so this is a two qubit circuit, right? It started with a Hadamard followed by a C0. Correct? That's it. So we said when the input could be any of the four product states, right? So as we discussed yesterday, if I have a two qubit register, right, then this is a state that belongs to C2 tensor C2, and this has as basis, the basis for this has these four states, right, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, and this input can be any of these four states. But again, as we discussed yesterday, these four states are product states. These four states are product states, which means that they can be factorized into the product of what I call local states on each system, okay? So I have two registers. If I want to call them A and B, for example, the state in A is clear. This is what it is. The state in B is clear. This is what it is. So this is what one would call local states. And also, these two uh, vector spaces are often called subsystems. So these are called subsystems, right? I have a bipartite space. There is a HA tensor HB, right? Then these local, so this is what I call local, right? In the sense, each individual uh, system so I'm often going to use this terminology, right, subsystem, and I will also call the states in these subsystems as local states in the sense that they're confined to a given Hilbert space or a given quantum system. They're not states that spread across multiple uh, systems, okay? Fine, so this is just because I, I'm very tempted to use the word local states all the time, and I'm, I was stopping myself yesterday, so I thought I'll define this terminology so, you know, I can freely Switch between all these uh, all these words. Fine. So we discussed the output yesterday. I hope everyone has worked out these four states. I know some of you gave me the answer in class yesterday, but I hope you have worked this out. That you get four states out here, right, corresponding to these four inputs, and these states are of the form zero zero plus one one by root two. Okay, so I'm writing them in some order. All right. Um, I, uh, you guys can, maybe I'll just write it like this. So, depending on which of the four inputs you have, uh, you have one of these four output states. So, I'm going to write this as 0, 0, plus, minus, 1, 1 over root 2, 0, 1, plus, minus, 1, 0 by root 2, right? Okay. So, what is the implication of a state like this? Now, we said, first of all, that these four states are of the form So, the first thing to note is that these four states cannot be factorized into local states.
what this means is they do not exist states psi so let me again put some label here a b just to keep track right they do not exist states psi a which belongs to the first qubit register and psi b which belongs to the second register such that beta x y is psi a tensor psi a tensor psi b So they do not exist at states, which means that the state cannot be expressed as a product state. So these are entangled states. So at this point, how is one defining entangled states? One is saying that these are states which cannot be factorized into simply the tensor product of the two. Uh, states in the two subsystems or tensor product of two local states of course this definition can be extended beyond two qubits also right i can think of a multi qubit setting or a multi partite setting in general right so this is a general definition i can think of some states i'm writing a different psi here to kind of denote that this is a multi qubit system Which exists on various systems A1, A2, A3, etc., up to A epsilon, right? So, for example, this could be an n qubit system. Right? We say that this is entangled if it cannot be expressed as some local psi one in A1 tensor, psi two in A2 tensor, etc., psi n in A n. And remember, we defined this tensor product yesterday, uh, rather on Monday. We, sh we we identified what the matrix multiplication scheme is, right? It's what's called the Kronecker product or the tensor product. And the way to do this across multiple systems is the same, right? What we whatever we discussed for a pair of vectors, how to take the Kronecker product, you just keep doing that repeatedly. If you want to get a n uh, qubit system or an n partite quantum state, right? So this is what we would call an n party or n partite quantum state. The state is an n party quantum state. It's just not if I if it is of this form, this is not an entangled state. But if it is of this form, where it cannot be expressed in this product form, then it's an entangled n qubit state, right? So our definition of entanglement is to say that these are states which cannot be factorized as Products, tensor products of local states on local subsystems, right? Now, hope probably in tomorrow or Friday's lecture, we'll start discussing about how to quantify entanglement. Can one first of all how to identify entanglement and how to quantify it? How to say that a particular state is more entangled or a particular state is less entangled, right? But for now, I will note that these Bell states that we've written down. Okay, I didn't write the formal name today. So, like I said, these are called Bell EPR states, right? Uh, does anybody know what EPR stands for? Some of the physics students here. Einstein put all. Einstein put all. Good. So EPR stands for Einstein Podolsky Rosen. uh does anybody know which year the paper uh, is this famous paper of epr any epr box here okay so i think this is a 1931 paper but please go check it out this is what used to be called physical review at that point what is today called physical review letters right so it's a 1931 physrev paper where they first Propose this idea that there could be states of this form, right? That quantum mechanics allows states of this form, right? Which cannot be written simply as the product of local states, right? So that's why these are called um, EPR states, also because they were the first to write down these kind of maximally entangled states. So these are what are called 
maximally entangled states. Okay. Uh, Einstein Podolsky Rosen wrote this actually not for this kind of two level system, right? But rather they wrote this for position and momentum, right? So they wrote this for infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces, essentially, right? So they wrote down an entangled state in two infinite dimensional spaces where the position momentum degrees of these two are entangled and then they argued that these states have interesting properties which are counter intuitive to what one our understanding of um, systems which was classical at that point right and of course for einstein podolsky rosen this was a failing of quantum mechanics that this was a feature uh, this was not a feature so much as a bug to them right particular einstein he was of the view that the fact that we are not able to explain some of the properties of this state from what we know of classical physics means that quantum mechanics somehow is incomplete, right? And this is a view that he held till the end, that Einstein held till the end. Anyway, we also visit some of these issues, uh, these more philosophical issues about the implications of entanglement. But for now, I just want to note that these are what are called maximally entangled states, right? Maximal, why? Like I said, we'll quantify this very shortly, right? But, and uh, so the third point then is to talk about, oh, uh, by the way, the other person on whom these states are named, who is uh, John S. Bell, you should also mention him. Uh, John S. Bell was actually a particle physicist, okay? Uh, at CERN, the early days of CERN the big particle um, collider Geneva. Um, then I think 1960s, um, I forget the exact year. So why, why do we also attribute his name to these states? Because he was the one who truly studied these entangled states for spin half systems, or rather spin systems in general. Because remember these two level systems that we're talking about, right, are actually spin systems, right? So he wrote down these kind of maximally entangled states for spin systems. He, in some sense, started from where EPR left off, okay? And he argued that their notion of completing, uh, I mean, Einstein's idea that quantum mechanics is incomplete uh, cannot be, uh, well, uh, he had a few things to say about it. We'll come to that. But more importantly, he gave a way of really testing for this entanglement, right? Really showing that these states, so what he did was to show that these states have correlations beyond what is possible in classical systems. So today we talk of entanglement as quantum correlation, okay? And that's the next aspect that I want to come to. So what are these correlations? So now imagine that I have prepared one of these Bell states, okay? See, I already showed you a preparation circuit, right? We in fact started by talking about a preparation circuit and this is something uh, one can do in a lab, right? If you have access to two qubit systems and you have access, you are able to implement a Hadamard and a C naught. What you have, you have, you have a Bell state at the output, right? You have one of these states at the output. Okay. So the fact that these states cannot be factorized into local product systems has, um, into rather product of local states, has some rather interesting consequences, particularly when you measure these systems, right? So now I'm going to say that I measure these two qubits, okay? And let's say I measure them in the zero one basis, which is the sigma z basis. So please recall all the, uh, you know, measurement ideas that we discussed it's already, I think, two weeks ago. So now what happens? When I measure any qubit, I get a classical bit at the output, right? Because I can get one of two values. Correct? In the zero one basis, I can either get outcome zero or one. Here again, I can get an outcome zero or one, right? So my question to you now is, are all possible classical outcomes, uh, are all classical outcomes possible, right? So this basically means I have two classical bits of here, right? So there's a B1 and a B2. 
so I can call this B1 and B2. Now, B1 can be 0 or 1 in general. B2 can be 0 or 1 in general. But you notice that because of the structure of the state, right, all pairs of classical outcomes are not allowed. So, I hope everyone sees that. So, which are the outcomes which are allowed? So, what are the possible outcomes now? Zero, zero and one, one. Sorry? Zero, Can zero you speak up louder, one. Neelkan? Zero, zero and one, one. These two combinations. Indeed, yeah. Zero, zero and one, one. Right? So, the idea is, when I have a state like this, right, this is, as I said, a superposition of two states, 0, 0, and 1, 1. This, if this denotes the first bit outcome, this denotes the second measurement outcome, right? You see that if the first measurement outcome is 0, which means that the first qubit, now, of course, this is a probabilistic process, right? So, the first qubit could either collapse to get 0 or to get 1. But if the first qubit collapsed to get 0, the second qubit also has to collapse to get 0. If the first qubit collapsed to get 1, the second qubit has to collapse to get 1. If I want to talk uh, in, in a spin language, if the outcome of the first measurement is spin up, the outcome of the second measurement must also be spin up. If the outcome of the first measurement is spin down, the outcome of the second one has to be spin down. If one has one observable gives me a plus half value, the other outcome also has to give me a plus half spin value. If one outcome gives me a minus half, the other outcome has to give me a minus half. So, this is a more physical way of saying it. In the qubit uh, language, uh, the only possible outcomes are 0, 0, and 1, 1. Right? So, these classical measurement outcomes are completely correlated. So, we also say that they are fully correlated, okay? Now, what are the probabilities with which these measurements occur? What is the, so I said finally, now typically if I take a two qubit register and I do this pair of measurements in the 0, 1 basis, right? Normally, right, there are four possible outcomes. Right? Because I'm measuring two qubits, each qubit can be 0, 1, right? So there are four possible outcomes, which are the four possible classical bit strings, right? Which is 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. Now I have, we have by looking at this state, we see that uh, these outcomes now are constrained, right? They can only be 0, 0, or 1, 1. But what are the probabilities of these outcomes now? What is the probability of getting a zero zero outcome on the two qubits? Half. Yes. So indeed, the probabilities are half. So the probability of the zero zero outcome is half, which is the same as the probability of the one one outcome. So if I were to look at the output distribution for this, it is a uniform distribution over these two outcomes zero zero and one one. The fact that both outcomes are equally likely is what is one feature of the fact that this is maximally entangled. Because it says in some sense, remember we talked a bit about uncertainty and so on, right? So we spoke about how the spread of the probability distribution is what captures the uncertainty in the measurement outcome, right? In some sense, it captures our lack of knowledge about this physical observable, right? And you see the fact that both these outcomes are equally likely means that we are maximally uncertain about the outcome.
okay so this is one feature of being a maximally entangled state the fact that it's a uniform superposition of two specific product states um, induces certain correlations and these correlations are maximal in the sense that one is maximally uncertain about the measurement outcome right and of course the measurement outcomes are perfectly or fully correlated right now you can go ahead and check that this is a feature of all four bell states right except that in some cases they will be perfectly correlated in other cases the outcome will be perfectly anti correlated right so states these two states right the outcomes the allowed outcomes are what in this case remember this is Zero the first bit value yeah. correct so in this case the outcomes are 0 1 and 1 0 so now these out the outcomes are perfectly anti correlated Whereas the other two bell states, which are the 0, 0, plus, minus, 1, 1 by 2, we just saw that they're perfectly correlated, right? Now, to contrast from the maximal entangled case, I could, for example, consider a state like this, which is, um, which is root 3 by 2, 0, 0, plus uh, 1 by 2, uh, one one, right? So consider this state. So this would be an example of a non-maximally entangled state, right? And you sort of understand the sense in which I'm saying this now, right? So now again, what are the possible outcomes? Remember zero, that zero, I have one. in mind all the time these two measurements in the zero one basis done independently on the two qubits. Huh? Yeah, what are the possible outcomes? One is going to answer. Okay. Yes? Zero, zero, and one, one. Indeed. So again, the possible outcomes are 0, 0, and 1, 1, except now they occur with different probabilities. Right? And what are these probabilities? 3 by 4, 3 by 4, 4, 4, 4. Exactly. Okay? So now you see, this is a less uncertain um, probability distribution, right? The 0, your more biased towards the 0, 0 outcome, you're more likely to get the 0, 0 outcome than the 1, 1 outcome. So this is a situation where there is still correlation in between the two qubits, but this amount of correlation is lesser in the sense that there is um, more of a tendency to be to, uh, towards the 0, 0 outcome than the 1, 1 outcome. Both outcomes are not equally likely. So this is a signature of being non-maximally entangled, right? And finally, before I get into teleportation, I just want to say one more, give you one more example. So consider the state. Excuse me, ma'am. Yeah. So, ma'am, this correlation is between uh, the two particles or is between uh, two states of this system, 0, 0, 1. <laughs> yeah. So now you're, you're, you're getting somewhat into this philosophical uh, realm with that question, right? So is it that the description of the state of the system has these correlations or are these two systems truly correlate? Hmm? Now that's a answer which depends on, uh, you know, whom you ask and what is their view of quantum mechanics, right? Now, what was the trouble? So, okay, let me come to this question. Uh, I, I, the answer to this question also lies in what was what was bothering Einstein about these kind of states, right? Okay, so now just um, this last question that I have for you guys. 
Now consider this state, okay? It's a valid two qubit state, right? It's normalized and everything. My question to you is, is so, it so an entangled state? Actually, someone has no. put a message on the group. Uh, they're asking for permission to enter. Sorry, they're asking for permission to? Enter the class. I oh. saw message on the group. Yeah. Why is that? Um. Oh, my voice is breaking sometimes, is it? Anyway, okay. So I try to fix that, but I don't see any uh, request or permission. And neither have I set up any such thing. So, um, yeah, I mean, just share the link. The password, you know, is qubit underscore 2021. So they can just enter. They should be able to enter using the password. So, Gunjan, whoever it is, you can just message them the password, the meeting password. Right. Yes, so one of, in the WhatsApp group, right? Yeah, yeah. Yes, I know. Right. Yeah. Okay. So my question is, um, is this? Is, are there such correlations in this state? No, ma'am. This is not entangled. How do you argue that? Uh, because it can be factorized as uh. 0 times 0 plus 1 by root 2. Exactly, exactly. So this can be written as 1 over root 2, 0 tensor product, 0 plus 1, right? Which is then the same as 0 tensor plus, right? I take this 1 over root 2 here. So this then is very much a product state, right? Now, now what happens when you measure this kind of a state? I guess my Bluetooth is acting up. Anyway, yeah, I'll try to uh, fix this. Try that. So this is the state, right? So now the state is what? 0, 0 plus 0, 1 by root, right? You can either view it like this, or you simply view it as a 0 here and a plus here, right? No matter which way you view it, you see that, what are the possible outcomes now? Yeah? And 0 on upper half, upper... Uh measurement and in case of second it will be zero or one with probability one by two. Right, exactly. So the possible outcomes are zero, zero and zero, one of course, which means that the first qubit is always the outcome you're always going to get the outcome zero. But that does not tell you anything about the outcome of the second measurement on the second qubit. Right? Because the second qubit could be either zero or one and in fact both outcomes are equally likely. Right, so I hope this contrasts the idea of an entangled state with correlations, whether perfect or little less than perfect, whether maximal or little less than maximal, but these states are all correlated. The measurement outcomes are all correlated, right? Whereas this state is a product state, and as you see, there is no correlation between the measurement outcome. The fact that the second qubit is zero, for example, doesn't tell you anything about the first qubit. The fact that the first qubit is zero, uh, well, of course, in this case, the first qubit is always zero, right? Uh, but their outcomes are really not correlated, right? So now what is the issue, right? Why is this? sort of um, counter-intuitive or, you know, what, what what's the trouble with having states like this, right? So I'll just pose it as a question here, as locality versus causality, okay? Uh, we'll resolve this or we'll, we'll, we'll 
we'll try to resolve this the way John S. Bell tried to resolve it uh, in a couple of lectures from now. But this is the issue. So now imagine that there is a uh, there's a situation where I have two parties, and this actually brings me to teleportation uh, almost immediately. So again, I have my two favorite people, Anita and Bharat. Okay. Now, uh, let's say Anita prepares. She has this well preparation circuit in her lab. Okay, and she takes a pair of photons. Okay. And she prepares this bell state. Okay. Now, in a pair of photons, what is the degree of freedom that I could entangle? One degree of freedom that I could entangle is the polarization. Okay. So I can write down a pair of polarization entangled photons, which means if the first photon is horizontally polarized, the second is also horizontally polarized. If the first is vertically polarized, the second is also vertically polarized. And in fact, there are natural physical processes which lead to these kind of correlated uh, pairs of photons. This is what is called parametric down conversion. Okay. So it's very easy to prepare this in a lab. In fact, we have a setup here in the electrical engineering department, in Professor Anil's lab, which makes pairs of entangled photons like this, right? And let's say that she, she keeps one of this entangled pair, okay? So this is, this is my de depiction of this entangled pair, and she sends the other one to Bharat, right? So now they each have a photon, Okay, which are which are the, the, these two photons are separated in space and time, right? But this photon still carries some information about what the state of this photon could be, and similarly, this photon. So I'll call these two photons as A and B now. A belongs to Anita's lab, and B belongs to Bharat's lab, and it's possible because they're photons to actually send them over a quantum uh, channel or just a fiber, right? And now you see, you have now generated correlations which are spatially se separated, right? Between two spatially separated systems, right? And now if they both make measurements on their local photons, they will find the, pol the polarization degrees of freedom to be perfectly correlate, right? Now, this seems to violate two crucial aspects of physics, which is locality and causality, right? So, for example, it doesn't matter who does the measurement first, right? No matter who does the measurement first or no matter whether they measure simultaneously, whatever that means, etc., the outcomes are perfectly correlated. And somehow, the fact that, so now you see, you can ask questions like this. Does the photon in Anita's lab know that the photon in Bharat's lab has been measured? How does the photon in Anita's lab know that it has to collapse to horizontal and not vertical polarization? When Bharat's uh, photon collapsed to became, you know, is, is horizontally polarized. Because there is now also this, the outcome is not fixed, right? So Bharat photon could either be horizontally polarized or vertically polarized. But no matter what it is, Anita's photon will be polarized in exactly the same way. So is there some kind of, so this is the, the term that Einstein used. I suppose people have heard this term. Right, spooky action at a distance. That somehow this photon seems to know that the other photon has collapsed to a particular state. So, is there some instantaneous communication happening? Is there some faster than light communication happening? Right, so this sort of non local effect, right? So, there is a certain non locality at play here, right? And this non-locality is what uh, uh, Einstein was deeply troubled by. 
and he felt that a physical theory which admits states like this and which admits phenomena like this is not a complete description of nature or reality right and he felt that there must be some hidden degrees of freedom which we don't have access to which is somehow dictating this choice of uh, you know this, this this which is somehow constraining these probability distribution right so einstein's idea to resolve this was to talk about hidden variable theory I'll briefly touch upon this in a couple of lectures when I talk about the Bell inequality. But to answer this question, I forget who Nilesh or Nilkant, I don't know who asked me this question about whether the particles are entangled or they are in an entangled state or some such. See, the point is, in our information about the state of the system or our information about these particles comes from the act of measurement. It is the act of measurement which will tell Bharat that this photon that he got is horizontally polarized or vertically polarized. The act of measurement that will tell Anita. So you see, what can they use it for, right? So now Anita knows that if she measures her photon and gets a vertical polarization, then the photon that has gone to Bharat must be vertically polarized, right? Because she knows she prepared an entangled state and she sent it to Bharat. So this can now be used by two parties to communicate in specific ways. However, for that communication to happen, a measurement must happen. And it is the measurement that reveals the correlation, right? Prior to measurement, the state of the system is this, where neither party really has information about this polarization degree of freedom. So it appears that our description of the state of the system comes from the act of measurement, right? And so what is, what is the inherent state of these particles is a hard thing to say in quantum mechanics, right? The state gets revealed by the act of measurement, right? And the act of measurement gives us statistics and that will tell us something about the state, right? So I would go with describing this as a description of this particular state of the particles it's a description which shows certain correlation between these two particles, which can extend beyond a particular space time, right? And that is sort of the, that's the point at which we get stumped because our understanding of classical physics does not permit such correlation. Does not, you know, it's sort of inconceivable. Well, someone asked me whether you can disentangle the two photons. Um, what happens once Anita and Bharat measure? Actually, what happens once Bharat measures? Forget, I mean, or one of them measures. Uh, the state collapses to one. Exactly. So okay. after measurement, the post-measurement state is indeed an unentangled state. So post-measurement, let's just describe this using the collapse, collapse postulate, right? The states would have either collapsed to HH or VV. That's it. So the act of measurement completely disentangles the state. Oh, okay, okay, I understand now. Yeah. Until you do the measurement, they are they continue to be entangled. Okay. And while they are entangled, they can be used to do interesting tasks, and that's what I want to come to next, which is quantum teleportation. Um, any further questions? Okay, so let me just add one final comment here that this whole idea that there is some spooky action at a distance hap happening, um, the way we today resolve it is by saying that there is no physical manifestation of such a spooky action at a distance in the following sense, right? That between Anita and Bharat, there still has to, uh, I mean, there is no, how do I put it? There's no faster than light communication happening or there's no violation of uh, special relativity in that sense. Because as we will see now with teleportation, for example, that you cannot really use these states to, to physically realize such a, you know, spooky action at a distance phenomenon. 
whatever is happening is happening at a uh, sort of particle level but our i don't know the observers access to this there's nothing spooky happening at the observer level right while it is true that these states carry hidden correlations and these correlations span space time from an observational point of view there's nothing spooky that is happening okay and we'll sort of see various manifestations of the statement that i just made in in different ways the first way is to understand what can these states be used for they can be used for something called quantum teleportation so one can think of this as an application of entanglement so the idea is the following again i have these two people a and b separated you know uh, in two separate labs uh, by the way so this this uh, this kind of experiment that i just described uh, i don't know whether people follow the news in general but so china has actually demonstrated this kind of this exact same phenomenon uh, entangling a pair of photons right uh, but what they did was they generated this entangled pair up in space okay and from space they beamed this pair of entangled photons to two ground stations where these two people a and b were sitting right to two separate labs and these two labs were actually separated by something like 5000 km Maybe it was I don't know, thousands of kilometers. So then they could claim that they had actually shown or demonstrated entanglement across thousands of kilometers. Right? I'll pull up that article and post it on the Moodle page. So I think I haven't posted it. Sorry, you didn't get it on Moodle for a time, so I'll do that. Um, so this is the Chinese satellite experiment. So they sent us a satellite in space, which had an apparatus to generate pairs of entangled photons. These were exactly entangled like this in the polarization degree of freedom, beamed to two ground stations, which were thousands of kilometers apart. And every time you measure in these two ground stations, you will find that the polarization uh, degrees of freedom are perfectly correlated between these remarkable um, experiment demonstrating. Very much that you know, the entanglement is very real, right? Um, and yeah, can be used, so to speak. Okay, so what can it be used for? So here is an example that these two uh, parties share a particular entangled state. Let's say they share the beta zero zero state. Okay. Now A also receives an additional single qubit state. okay now what teleportation demonstrates is that this arbitrary single qubit state and it's arbitrary i'm i'm i've written down a general superposition of 0 and 1 right so the way that people typically describe this is by saying that some third party c actually gives a the state right prepares the state and gives it to a the point is that a does not know what the single qubit state is of course a could measure right but as you know measuring a single copy of this state is not going to reveal any information about the state a single measurement will either collapse the state to zero or one and that's it the superposition is broken right and a gets exactly one copy of this state so this is an unknown or arbitrary state the question is can a communicate the state to b is there a way for a to communicate the state to b perfectly right and by sharing this entangled pair right what can happen is a can actually teleport the state to b 
And the word teleport is deliberately used here because the state effectively disappears from A's lab and appears in B's lab at the end of the protocol. Okay? So note that it is not that A has a copy of the state and she sends across another copy to B. No. The state effectively disappears from A's lab and appears in B's lab. Then one says appears. Remember now, let's count qubits, right? So A has how many qubits now? A has this entangled pair, I should probably use a different color for the entangled pair and a different color for the teleported qubit. So they have an entangled pair, right? And so this is two qubits first that they start with. And then A receives a third qubit. There's a third qubit that comes into play, which is in this arbitrary state. So at the end of the protocol, this state, the second state in A's lab is collapsed, right? And what happens is that B's qubit essentially somehow takes on this state, right? B's qubit, the, the, the half of the entangled pair that B has is transformed to this state. So let me first draw a circuit that describes this and then we see how that works. So, it's a teleportation circuit. I'll just draw the circuit today and we'll do the analysis in tomorrow's class. So, I need to have three registers, right? So, this is now a three qubit circuit. Okay. So, the first two qubits are going to be A's qubit. And the third one is going to be B's qubit. Now, A2 and B. So, essentially, I'm putting these labels here. So, this is A2, this qubit that is entangled with B's qubit, right? And this qubit, which is the arbitrary unknown qubit that A receives, that is the A1 qubit, okay? So, this is what the circuit looks like. So I'm going to use these labels throughout. So this pair of qubits are entangled, right? This is in the arbitrary single qubit state. Psi and psi is understood to be some arbitrary superposition, alpha 0 plus beta 1, single qubit state. Now what does A do? First, A applies a C0 between the unknown state which she has received, the state which has been prepared by someone else and, you know, given to A's lab and say, please teleport this to B. Okay. So, A first establishes this entangled pair between her lab and B's lab and then does a C0 first between the unknown state and her half of the entangled state. So, A2 is what I'll refer to as A's half of the is one half of the entangled state. B's qubit is the other half of the entangled state. But first, she does a C0 between the unknown state and her half of the entangled state, follows it up with the Hadamard. Okay? You notice the similarity and the difference to the Bell state preparation circuit. That also involved a Hadamard and a C0, but that involved first a Hadamard and then a C0. Right, this is in, this involves a C naught followed by a Hadamard, right, and then two measurements. That's it. So A then measures. So I'm calling these two measurements as M1 and M2, okay, because I want to label the outcome. Okay, so the outcome, as I always say, is a classical bit. This I call little M1, which can either be zero or one. And this is little m2, 
which can also be 0 or 1, right? These are the two classical outcomes. Now I'm drawing two wires here, and two wires for me indicate classical bit. These classical outcomes are then communicated to B. B has done nothing so far. A has performed these two gates, performed two measurements, and then the classical outcomes of these two measurements are communicated to B classically, which means A essentially picks up a telephone and says, hey, for M2, I got bit value 0. For M1, I got bit value 1, right, or something like that. Now, B has to apply two gates, or rather one of two gates, depending on the outcome of this classical measurement. Okay. Note that once these two measurements have happened, A state is effectively destroyed, right? This tie is effectively destroyed because the measurement has collapsed uh, both these qubits to either 0 or 1, right? So there is M1 and M2. Now, depending on M1 and M2, so I'm going to call this as X raised to M2 and Z raised to M1, right? Which simply means that if M1 is 1, then Z gets applied. If M1 is 0, Z doesn't get applied and vice versa. And finally, B, and this is what we'll analyze tomorrow and show, B actually, then B's qubit is actually left in the state psi. Okay? So the state psi has disappeared from here and essentially appeared in B's lab. So this is the simple teleportation circuit and we'll analyze this tomorrow. Let me stop here. Questions? Uh, excuse me, ma'am. Mm -hmm. uh, so, ma'am, in the beginning of the lecture, we saw that we were defining the entangle between uh, two different qubits based on the measurement outcome of the qubits. So, mm -hmm. I mean, given a arbitrary uh, state psi, which may be an entangled state or not, without any performing measurement on the qubit or on the state psi, can we determine if it's entangled or not? See, if you give me a mathematical description of the state, which means if you tell me what it is, like, you know, you write this out, 0, 0, plus 0, 1, plus something, etc. Then I have a technique to identify whether something is an entangled state or not. And that we will study. It's called the Schmidt decomposition. But if experimentally you give me an unknown two qubit state, how do I check whether the state is entangled or not? That is actually a hard problem in general. Okay? And I can give you some examples in uh, subsequent lectures to argue why that is a hard problem. So today what people do is they come up with what are called entanglement witnesses. Okay? Those are specific measurements that people can do to identify whether a particular pair of qubits is entangled or not, right? So the word that's used is entanglement witness. So you can go and look up the literature. I think by now you have enough background actually to even read some of these papers uh, which talk about entanglement witnesses, okay? So it's a practical question, right? How, how do I check whether a given pair that I have is entangled or not? So one way is to use an entanglement witness Another way is to do what is called a Bell test, okay? And this is something we will discuss uh, early next week. This is what is called a Bell CHSH test, where you can actually do some set of measurements and quantify the correlations between the two qubits. And then you can assign a threshold value and say that if these correlations go beyond something, then these two are intact. Okay, that's called the Bell CHSH test. But all of these, I must say, require multiple copies of the state. Because a single quantum measurement, as you know, is a, is a probabilistic thing. So you need statistics. Okay, so for any of these tests, whether entanglement witness or Bell CHSH test, you need multiple copies of the state before you can um, decide or confirm whether it's an entangled state or not. Okay.
uh, so ma'am if the mathematical description of the state is provided then hmm. also uh, i mean we can uh, say that what is the amount i mean if the state is maximally entangled or not or if they are correlated or anti correlated or not this is only possible if the mathematical uh, description of the state is provided right correct yeah yeah okay so, so i, I mean if know, someone example, gives me if it's a, yeah so if the two cubic state uh, i need to know what this a b c d are right so if the most general state remember is like this right plus b one one so i need to know what a b c d are even that is actually a mathematically hard problem beyond qubits by the way ha huh. because you can imagine right as the system size grows the dimensionality can also grow so there are various possibilities of entangled state right now this state just by inspection you told me ah this is actually 0 tensor plus right mm -hmm. but in general it's not possible to do this by inspection it requires already some mathematical machinery if you give me a general state like this with coefficients a b c d it's not i cannot immediately tell you whether it's entangled or not in fact i'll give you a problem in the assignment which you will have to spend some time working out whether the state that i've given you is actually entangled or not okay so yeah so even with the mathematical description it is sometimes hard to know whether a state is entangled or not but there are specific uh, techniques one can use but experimentally you need multiple copies of the state before you can decide okay yeah uh, thank you ma'am uh, and ma'am uh, one more uh, i had one more question that okay. we saw entanglement in case of uh, pure states of the qubits or the quantum system that we are choosing mm -hmm. here but mm -hmm. in case of a mixed state can we also describe entanglement the same way we did for uh, the systems very good yeah i will come to mixed state entanglement next week it's a much harder um, uh, i mean it's a much more subtle concept with mixed state right uh, it's not as straightforward as just a tensor product of two states you can that that definition even to define mixed state entanglement is slightly more subtle than not as direct as pure state entanglement but we will discuss that we will discuss that okay yeah okay thank you ma'am yeah. sure oh, ma'am yeah um uh, question regarding the um, one which you are talking about the china did some experiment right yeah um during that you mentioned about um, uh, multiple times they measured so which means Correct. Correct. let's say if they send a pair of put on to a different location as soon as they measured uh, in one end or let's say in the both end it will be mm -hmm. collapsed in one state and it will be uh, disentangled so which means in correct. order to do correct. another measurement they need to send another pair of photons right correct correct yeah yeah okay. that's what i said multiple copies see okay. it's a statistic game okay so if i claim that i have a apparatus that generates entangled photons i have to generate 100 entangled photons observe okay. the statistics at the end and then show that these two are perfectly correlated right otherwise how can i make the claim with a given pair how can i so for example if china claims that they did this experiment with one entangled pair of photons how do we know whether they really prepared an entangled pair or they simply prepared the horizontal two photons both in horizontal polarization sent one photon here sent one photon there that's it both will always be horizontally polarized that is not entanglement the idea is you prepare 100 such entangled pairs the outcome could either be horizontal or vertical in in you know for each pair but every time one pair one of the photons is horizontal the other is also horizontal one of this is vertical the other is also vertical so it's only when you do multiple copies experimentally can you verify can you claim can you detect this correlation right yeah okay i hope it's clear right i mean i can always have a machine which only makes horizontal polarization okay and i can send keep sending pairs of horizontally polarized photons to two different locations that is not entangled <laughs> yes okay yeah um siddharth your question is about whether the separation has any effect practically 
see practically of course as you uh, send photons over long distances they will undergo noise they will undergo decoherence right so their state will be disturbed it will not be this ideal situation that one is describing but they will not collapse the collapse happens only with the measurement at the end right they will undergo some decoherence so the correlations will not be perfect so if 100 entangled pairs are prepared you will not see a this perfect correlation between all 100 pairs there will be some small fraction uh, where they will not be correlated so that's an error right but they do remain entangled yes yes oh, okay. so it is an ideal scenario where there are no other physical processes happening and some of these um, whether they are beaming them over space or over fiber the photons uh, you know don't undergo decoherence somehow magically then yes they will be entangled there is nothing that prevents them from uh, remaining entangled right yeah so this is the fact that bothered uh, einstein right so you prepare a photon here and you send it to the moon ideally nothing happens you have an entangled pair between the earth and the moon right okay fine yeah. so let's stop here and continue tomorrow